The question is, do you agree that Scotland should be an independent country? For me, the principle that we work best when we work together. Well, they didn't. Very serious. The referendum. It seems to me that they're not dealing with the issues. When I was a child, I was taught of a long ago battle. It was a monumental battle, an invading army and a defending one, swords and shields, bows and arrows. The attackers were somehow both bad men and good, and the defenders lost. Their king dead in the sight of the sea. When I grew up, I realised that the defenders were not of my country. They were of what then was my country's neighbour, the attackers from yet further still. I felt a degree of confusion that I should have been taught something that was not of my country's past, but of the past of my country's neighbour. When I was a child, I was taught of a document written by a medieval nobility to maintain their power and limit the interference of their king. The document's concepts were difficult to understand and little, but the age of the document left a lasting impression. When I grew up, I realised that the document was not written by the nobility of my country, it was written by the nobility of what was then my country's neighbour. I found it hard to understand why I should have been taught such a thing that for many hundreds of years was at best only tangentially relevant to my country. When I was a child, I was taught of a writer, a bard of great renown whose works inspired untold numbers around the world. The writer's words and meanings, written such a long time ago in a language I could barely understand, were difficult to interpret, yet gamely I worked on. When I grew up, I realised that the bard was not of my country, although died a decade after his country and mine were first part joined. I wondered why the work of a writer who was not of my country should be so influential on the language that is most spoken in my country. When I was a child, I was taught a language named after the country that neighbours my own. I never understood why the language I spoke should be named so. As an adult, I learned of a long ago battle. It was a monumental battle, an invading army and a defending one, swords and shields, bows and arrows. The attackers were bad men and they lost, defeated by defenders whose number was half that of the attackers. When I thought back to being a child, I felt a degree of confusion that I should not have been taught something that was so integral to the foundation of the country in which I live. As an adult, I learned of a document written by medieval nobility to maintain their power and proclaim the very existence of their country. The document's concept was clear, containing an unequivocal statement of rights. When I thought back to being a child, I found it hard to understand that I should not have been taught such a strong statement of my country's nationhood and right to exist, written at a time when both were under dire threat. As an adult, I learned of a writer, a bard of great renown, whose works inspired untold numbers around the world. The writer's words and meanings, written some time ago in a language I could barely understand, were difficult to interpret, yet gamely I read on. When I thought back to being a child, I wondered why a writer of such import to my country was not a part of my language education, and why it was he wrote in a language I was not taught. As an adult, I learned of a language named after the country in which I live. I was stunned to discover that it was a language in its own right, more than a mere regional dialect of a language named after my country's neighbour, to be shunned from the classroom, fit only for the uncouth of the schoolyard. Do not get me wrong, I am glad that my education included some of the history and culture of my neighbours. To be taught not, but the history and culture of my own country would have been deeply unfortunate, demeaning, parochial. However, to have had the history and culture of my own country so thoroughly eradicated from my education was wrong. To be denied one's history and one's culture is close to being denied one's right to exist. It is to be dominated, crushed like a rebel by a mighty empire. It may well be the case that the culture and history of my country is no longer so thoroughly excised from the education of my country's children. However, it is not something of which I have any knowledge. 
What I do have knowledge of is not simply the commonly seen ignorance of my country's worth. I also have knowledge of the equally common and far more corrosive denial that my country has any worth at all. It saddens me greatly to be aware that so many of my fellow subjects have so little knowledge of their country and have so little confidence that we can run our own affairs. For a long time, through the denial of our past, through the denial of our culture, through the denial of our country's right to exist, we have been denied all that countless numbers around the world have as their birthright. It is time we acknowledge the worth of ourselves as a nation and as a people, no better and no worse than so many others. We have a rich heritage and a strong culture, if only we could recognise it. We have the right to exist, and we have the right to make the decisions that are best suited to our country. It is time we stood up and recognised our worth. It is time to break from the imposed ignorance. It is time to be the change. Hello, this is Scottish Independence podcast number 40, and what you've just heard is a piece called When I Was a Child by Stuart Bremner. I'm sure there's quite a few things you recognise from your childhood in there as well. By trade, however, Stuart is an illustrator and designer, and uh, he's also now working for Yes Scotland, helping to make the graphic. We had a conversation about his work and also about the campaign so far. So we'll just go straight to it, and I'll have a wee word with you at the end. Hello, Stuart. How's it going? Ah, pretty good. It's a bit cold this morning, but it's a nice sunny day. Yeah, cold here as well. I just wanted to ask you first before we get started properly. Have you been really impressed in the last couple of days that Better Together managed to read and absorb a 600-page document in about five minutes and have such cogent criticisms ready? I was stunned by how fast they can read. I thought that was a very particularly great effort on their part. Very impressed. If that wasn't the case, that they could read so fast, it was nice of the Scottish government to send Anna Sarwar uh, an advanced copy so that he could uh, peruse it and come up with such I, a... I, I thought that was great because, you know, um, and yes, Scotland, we didn't get an advanced copy, so it's nice that they're actually keeping it amongst people that are really important. <laughs> so um, you've been involved in the campaign in a number of ways, making posters um, for Bella Caledonia, and I believe you've uh, recently been taken on by the official campaign, Yes, Scotland. Would you like to talk about your, your role there? Yeah, well, um, as you said, I, I was making stuff basically off my own back since around about February of this year, or January actually, it's been a while, and slowly just making more, getting a bit more following on Twitter, stuff like that. And yeah, uh, I talked to Stuart Kirkpatrick of the digital team um, at a digital ambassadors meeting in the summer, and from that, more things followed. And yeah, about six weeks ago, I started working for yes, yeah, Scotland doing their digital graphics, so just, you know, trying to get something a bit more coherent than what we had been doing in the past. It's really interesting going from being a, a volunteer on the edge of it right into the middle. So it, I've been really enjoying the the difference. It's, take, it's kind of taken over my life, actually, I think. And um, I've only been listening to Better Together, so how is it working there in the headquarters amongst all the skullduggery and evildoers? Yeah, no, we, we always uh, we we, we get, like to get together in the morning and hatch plots, and uh, you know it, it's uh, there's a lot of camaraderie there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, it's it's interesting actually becoming official, let's say, because it, it really does make you think a bit more, a bit more about what it is I'm doing. So I'm, I find myself thinking more about how I'm putting things out in public than I was doing in the past, where I was a bit less worried about uh, reactions. Never think because I'm more right in the middle of this but basically I have to be a little bit more circumspect in what I'm saying so in the, you know, in the past months I may have put something that was slightly less positive or maybe maybe slightly reactionary I don't know how you want to uh, describe it and now I'm much more careful hmm. I guess Do you find that can be uh, liberating or do you find that quite restrictive? Actually the, the, the liberating yeah because it make, really makes me think about the words that I'm using so it, I become, you know, I really become much more focused. So uh, there's less of the kind of, oh, that's funny, shove it out there. It's more, oh, that's funny, right? Put it down, walk away, do something else, come back and look at it. And so it's it's like an extra filter. And so I think it, I think it improves quality definitely. Hmm. On the subject of quality, one of the first things of yours that I noticed was on Bella Caledonia a while back, and uh, I played it in the introduction of this podcast, the uh, When I Was a Child video. But I know that listening to it is kind of self-evident, but was there a reason that you decided to do that in particular? You know, I can't remember exactly what it was that 
it was worse, it was one of those kind of thoughts that I was just lying in bed one morning and I was thinking about the past and about yeah history whatever and culture I, th- and I think culture especially and the, just the, the ideas just kind of slowly came together and from that I just started writing I, I've written a couple of articles in the past about reasons for supporting independence my particular history with it if you like and this one felt like something that needed to be said because I hadn't really seen this particular argument put forward anywhere and I thought it was important to talk about that. I wrote the piece as a, anyway, as an actual written article first and then uh, realised that actually pre- essentially performing it by speaking it it could have more impact and that's where the video came from. And because it's an interesting area, because this was done before you were officially part of uh, Yes Scotland, but this isn't an area that Yes Scotland team seem to work on. They seem to work on more economic and uh, civic areas mm-hmm. of the debate. But that um, historical cultural element, something that it comes in in other places, but Yes Scotland tend to keep out of. Yeah, I, I'm not. I'm not sure if that's a intent or just something that they've not uh, considered yet. Um, it's, it's not something that I've actually discussed in the office, so I, I don't know the particular reasons why they haven't gone down the cultural historical route yet. Partly because I mean, um, that really is literally history. It's, it, it's history. You know, it's my personal history, and the Yes campaign really is looking to the future. For the most part, it is talking about what happens, what what we can do, how things can be better, and um, how we can change what we have now. So. Talking about how our history and culture, you know, how we were taught it in the past is, is looking backwards. And I think that's probably one of the main reasons is the official campaign needs to look forwards. And I, and I suspect that's partly why they've not really gone down this route too much. Because, as you said earlier, the, this particular thing was written before I was part of it. And it is very much a personal viewpoint. It's not something that, yes, Scotland would say, I imagine. But I, I can imagine if they did focus on that too much, there would be histrionics from the other side. Uh, this is Braveheart Bilge and, uh, and all this sort of nonsense. Yeah, I mean, that, that is a danger um, of bringing that film up. It, it's essentially, a, it's just used to beat the Yes campaign, that film. And I, I think it, if you go near anything even close to that particular part of our history, then it can be seen as self-defeating, I think. Mm. So when it came out, what kind of reaction did you get to it the When I Was a Child? Well, um, initially, it was, as I said, it was a written piece and it was published on Wings Over Scotland and it had a really, a really great reaction. Um, I, I was quite surprised by it. Um, I'd written a piece describing my own particular journey to um, being pro-independence earlier in the year and that, and that had some good response. But the history and culture one really had a powerful response and a lot of resonance with people. Um, there were, of course, people who said, oh, no, I was taught my history, I was taught culture, but for the most part, and I think especially across the central belt, uh, a lot of people had no, you know, they, they saw, in my story, they saw their education, they saw the lack of history, the lack of culture in what they had been taught at school. And it was, you know, it was a lot of it. And so it really, I think it, it, it gave everyone a voice in some ways. A lot of people were saying, yes, that happened to me. And it was kind of empowering, I think, because it, it got people to look back at how they had been taught and how it had formed who they are now. It's something we've brought up uh, a number of times throughout all the podcasts, the lack of mm. Scottish history in Scottish schools. Uh, and another corollary of that is, um, you know, the use of uh, Scots language in schools. And um, people of my generation, maybe of yours as well, can remember being punished for speaking in Scots. Yeah, yeah, no, that that was exactly something that I recall happening at school. Um, you'd never say I. If you even, if you even tried to say that, you got in trouble. And it was always yes. You were always very much, and it was very much, you know, the case that you had to speak in English, and anything that was seen as a colloquial Scots word was punished. And you know, it wasn't even until I think I wasn't even in, in my thirties until I realised that Scots was actually seen as a language in its own right. And I've got friends now, well-educated, clever friends, who who, who only have just found out. I tell them that Scots is a language, and they're shocked because they have only ever understood it as being that. Um, What's, oh God, uh, like a, a vulgar dialect that we're told. Dialect, yes, exactly. It, it was a it was a dialect, and they have only they were seen it as that vulgar dialect. And so when somebody says, actually, it's got a lang- it's a language in its own right with a history that's equal to English, it really shocks them. And and it's interesting that that's happening still now. People who are denied this sort of education in their past coming to these realizations as an adult, and it really changes their world. You know, it's suddenly like, oh, what? But 
that you know they're, they're kind of lost for words ironically <laughs> if we can just move on a bit there's a question i ask everyone which is that yeah. what was it that made you support independence because for some people it's it's just something that always seemed obvious for some people it's cultural for some people it's economic some people it's a mix of things 